Hey, everybody, before we get started, I just want to let you know that this isn't an easy one. Um, There is a lot of talk about some violence and horrific stuff that's happening around the world. I try to censor it as much as I can, but, you know, it's not an easy one. So if you need to take a few breaks or if you need to come back and see this one on a different day, I completely understand. Back when I had about 50 subscribers, I made a video about the rapture. It was about the third or fourth video I had made and I was trying a couple different things. A couple things that worked and I've continued to do and a couple things I vowed never to do again, like using long clips from Vox Media and Vice Media. Every topic I discuss gets different types of comments from Christians. A lot of times I'm called to bait a soy boy or told that I'm lying for views and, of course, that I'm going to hell. I'm told that I do not know my Bible at all, I don't understand the religion at all, and, of course, the version of Christianity I'm talking about isn't the true version, so it doesn't matter anyway. But with the rapture video, I am still regularly told that the rapture isn't biblical, so it doesn't matter. Or that the rapture is definitely biblical, and I'm going to find out myself when I'm left behind. But the thing is, I don't really care which one is more biblical. I care what a lot of people believe and how that affects people around them. And one of the things I pointed out in that video is the way that evangelical Christians have blindly supported the nation of Israel in hopes of bringing on the rapture, and how that has real-world really deadly consequences. And here we are three years later, and I think we can all agree that those deadly consequences have been on full display over the last few months. Yeah, where from? Israel. Just got to be too dangerous. I mean, you know, with everything that's happening. Well, that's a tough situation uh, you yeah, got over you got there. that whole tsunami and yeah, the... No, no, uh, no, well, the that. Superdome thing that... They no, there's no Superdome. It's one of those places over there. So it's a different country trying, trying to help the guy out. Why don't you just shut up? But pastors are still super excited about it. Let's talk Palestine. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all the other awesome stuff you do because you're awesome people. I put the links down below for the social media as well as the Patreon and the merch, so click down there. Um, You're all just so wonderful, so lovely. Uh, I love you all. For a lot of us, these last few months have been really hard. Seeing the worst of humanity broadcast to our phones on a daily basis, and knowing that it's our tax dollars that are paying for this, that are paying for this mass murder, and that our governments are sending them weapons to do it with their full support. And we sit here and we feel useless trying to figure out if there's anything we can do. And we become more and more outraged by the silence and the apathy of those around us and wonder why everyone isn't screaming from the rooftops about this. That is, unless you're an evangelical preacher who is obsessed with end times prophecy. In that case, you are super excited. And these last few months have been an extended Christmas. I've had the honor of preaching and teaching for more than 30 years. And every week I get excited and I'm, I'm very motivated to teach God's word. And then every once in a while, it feels like there is an intersection of the word of God and what's going in the world that God rules over. And that's this prophetic timing and this perfect anointing and this opportunity to open God's word and to unlock what's going on in the world. And I believe I believe this is that day. So I've been praying for you. I'm very excited and honored to be with you. And uh, I've titled this one, The Prophetic Mind-Melting Connection Between Ancient Judges and the Current War in Israel. The bottom line is this, everyone, and I'm very serious about tonight. I know there's already a lot of you on here. I want you to get serious about this because we're literally watching Bible prophecy happen before our eyes. Like this is the first generation in history where we are watching live Bible prophecy happen. And I get chills when I say that because as I'm rec- as I'm filming this, I've been having the news on live, different sources, different broadcasts, and I'm watching Bible prophecy unfold before our eyes. The most accurate age to live in regarding the fulfillment of Bible prophecy and or the teen up, if I can put it that way, the, the stage setting parameters of end times prophecy. Uh, we could say that the... The fuse is about to be lit if it hasn't been lit already. I guess all those other times we thought it was happening, we were dumb idiots who were wrong. But this time, this time, it's really happening. What does this all reveal? The Bible says that in the last days, the Jewish people will return to Israel and become a nation again. So it's all happened. 
It says that Israel will be the center of controversy, and so Israel is once again in the center of the news and controversy. World War II is no longer a news story. The Cold War is not a news story. The Reagan years, Clinton years, Obama years, not the... It's on fire. It was so the story, but Israel is still the story and the same controversy that it was before. The Bible says it would be. First thing I believe that the war in Israel is telling us is that God's promises are real. Really? That is your takeaway from all this bloodshed? That God's promises are real? That's your main takeaway? All the children who have been killed and your takeaway is God fulfills his promises? Also, I couldn't do a video about end times preachers and not bring back Robert Breaker. The Bible tells us that that will be taking place, that the Jews will rebuild their temple because that's when the Antichrist comes in and sits in the temple. Where's the sign of his coming? I love to hear scoffers say, it's never going to happen. You're running your mouth like that is a testimonial. It's closer to happening than it's ever been before. The fact that you do not believe that Christ is coming back is living proof that he will soon appear. If you listen closely, you can hear the footsteps of Messiah in the clouds of glory coming to rapture the church victorious. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. If I was trying to convince a bunch of people that a really dumb prophecy was going to take place, I would also add in that people will think it's dumb. That way, when people point out that it's dumb, then you can say, see, the prophecy is true. But that's just me. Oh, so stupid. Oh, shh. But however horrible everything is in Gaza right now, these wonderful men of God will find a way to make it about them. Today, actually, I was supposed to be broadcasting from Israel back here to the church a video for this morning's teaching, uh, leading a group of a couple hundred from our church. And thankfully, um, the, you know, we weren't there when the war broke out. Um, so we thank the Lord for that. Shut up! God, don't make this all about you. And so what we're dealing with in the book of Judges, it is a course of 300 years of human history, and it is a series and succession of wars in Israel. I picked this sermon series more than a year ago before there was war in Israel. Didn't know there would be a war in Israel, but God did. It's the first war in Israel in 50 years. Could have not anticipated that. Well, it's not like there's been 50 years of peace. There were a few clues you could have picked up that could have led you to think that there could be some violence in Palestine. But also your sermon was about spiritual warfare, right? And not about a physical war. But yeah, sure, God gave you a heads up. But it's in that video I shared, I saw a vision from God where I saw rockets, rockets igniting and preparing for liftoff. And I heard the phrase, many rockets. What did we see happen just in the last 24 hours? Uh, uh, rocket attacks, right? Many rockets, thousands of rockets. So this, all of this was prophesied ahead of time through a prophetic message that God had me share that I actually streamed back on January 3rd, 2024, just a few weeks before all of this started to go down. And the video title was, I saw a critical day coming this month. January prophecy. So this is something that God told me was going to be happening in the month of January. I'm going to show you the timelines here. If you would like to verify this prophetic message for yourself, you can go watch that original video and the link is going to be below this video in the description on YouTube. You can make sure that I actually said these things ahead of time and then listen to this prophetic word, y'all, and see how it connects to all of these events that have been taking place. So the God of the universe wanted there to be violence in his holy land. He didn't want it to stop because prophecy, but also he's really bad at keeping secrets. So he tells problematic pastors and Christian YouTubers who are way too full of themselves. Danny, want to hear a secret? We're doing the plan. Huh? Felix is planning to get fish soda away from the wharf. Lynn. He doesn't have any idea. He doesn't have a clue. Linda, we can hear you. Now, what does that mean? I've been getting a lot of emails from people saying, Brother Breaker, talk about the war in Israel, what that means, and what, what's going on. And a lot of people are saying this. They're saying, Brother Breaker, you were right about all this. Well, I'm not going to toot my own horn. It's not about me being right. It's about the Bible being right. And if you know your Bible, you know what's going to happen. Bobby, 
can I can I call you Bobby? We have seen your other videos. You don't know what's going to happen. You're just guessing. Coming to pass this year, 2015, and all the way up to 2018. A lot of meteors supposed to be hitting the earth. I tell you, it's a sign of the times. I see the Lord coming, and I see Him coming soon. I cannot believe we're already in the year 2019. This is exciting. Um, I'm surprised we're still here, to be honest with you. I was fingers crossed, hoping, praying, wishing that the Lord Jesus Christ would come back in 2018, and He did not. So we're still here, unfortunately. And I want to start it off with a bang. I figured let's talk about the possibility, the question of, could the rapture be this year? Boy, fingers crossed, I hope so. And what is curious about this is that the war hit October 7, 2023, when I was in First and Second Thessalonians, a book in the New Testament. We hit chapters four and five, which is on the second coming of Jesus. And it talks about birth pains. And there it's echoing the language of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that as we near the end of human history and the war of Armageddon, where the nations turn against Israel, that ultimately it would be like birth pains. They would increase with frequency and intensity as the coming of Jesus was drawing near. Well, all of that culminated in uh, the most popular sermon I've had the honor of preaching in more than 30 years. Maybe don't make this about you right now. One day before Terry and I were supposed to board an airplane to fly to Israel, on Saturday last week, Saturday, October the 7th, 2023, 1,500 Hamas terrorists penetrated the security fence around Gaza came into Israel on motorcycles, jeeps, and paragliders from the air, and brutally, savagely murdered Israelis at this music festival in Raim. On September 21, which we lived most of us in that day, United States was attacked. Ah, yes. September 21, I remember it well. Weird that they went with 9-11 instead of 9-21, but uh, still, it was, a, it was a horrible event. And 3,000 people died. What happened a week ago was Israel's 9-11. And I'm sure the question is, on everybody's mind, will you now take the opportunity to condemn what Hamas did on October the 7th? Do you, do you condemn Hamas? Yes. There is a lot wrong with Hamas. I wish there was a very different type of resistance, and I wish October 7th did not happen. And I disagree with almost all of what Hamas stands for, except for that we both want to free Palestine. So yeah, I blame Hamas, but I also blame the Israeli government way more for creating an open-air prison, for creating an apartheid state, for decades of violence against Palestinians, for being too busy suppressing Palestinians in the West Bank in order to protect their own illegal Israeli settlements so they were not there to protect their people on October 7th. And I blame the people around the world who continue to support the Israeli government and their horrendous actions against the Palestinian people that have been going on for almost 76 years now. Of course, there's the other question. Aren't you being anti-Semitic by not standing with Israel? When it comes to Israel and anti-Semitism, people just are crazy. And I've said this before, anti-Semitism is not an ideology. It's not a belief, it's a spirit, it's demonic. Because no one can really articulate why everybody hates the Jews. And I'll tell you why everybody hates the Jews, is because they came from God, because they hate God. Israel's existence is proof of God's existence. The only nation ever started by God was the nation of Israel. He started it with a man named Abram, who became Abraham. And so Israel's existence proves God's existence, and that's why Satan hates it. And that's why people who are ungodly also hate them. Any First things first, I hate anti-Semitism. And I know that the Jewish people have had so much hate and so much suffering for way too long. But I also know that the Jewish people don't all have the same opinions and don't all act in the same way. Because of course they don't, because they are a people group and not the Borg. Freedom is irrelevant. Self-determination is irrelevant. You must comply. And I don't want to look like I'm tokenizing here and say that, hey, look, some Jewish people agree with me, so therefore it's okay to say whatever I want about Jewish people. But I do think it's important to point out that many, many Jewish voices have also spoken out about what is happening to the Palestinian people right now. 
continue our coverage of Gaza as we turn to California, where hundreds of Jewish activists and their allies shut down the California state capitol in Sacramento Wednesday during its first floor session of the new year to demand a ceasefire in Gaza. I can't, I can't be a Zionist. No way. And such an injustice, such a cruelty, such distortion. I mean, you know, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, a lot of Israelis were, were, were not so ardent Zionists. That they've become more ardent. I was brainwashed as a youngster. I, I, was, a, I was a Zionist. I was proud of Israel. I had to, uh, you know, educate myself. This is the first time I am using my full real name um, to stand in solidarity with Palestinians. And I, I don't deserve applause because I am too late. Um, because every single day that we don't speak out as Jews in support of Palestinian liberation is another day too late. Um, I grew up in a Jewish American school system that was explicitly Zionist, um, that, I, I mean, I feel like we've all heard stories, but that um, didn't just make sure we didn't talk about Palestine, um, but actively taught us not to empathize with Palestinians. Um, and the kind of fear and repression that leads Jews who would say more to be silent is why Israel can continue to do what it's doing. Criticizing Netanyahu and criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitism. It's seeing an action that human beings are doing and criticizing that action for the evil that it is. Criticizing the Italian prime minister isn't anti-Italian hate. Criticizing Kim Jong-un isn't anti-Asian hate, and criticizing Netanyahu is not anti-Semitism. But pastors have a different idea. God is prophesying that, yes, Israel is going to experience persecution. They are going to experience wars. They're going to experience these other nations trying to destroy them. But because they are protected by God, because they are ultimately God's chosen people, God is saying that even though they may try to do this, I'm going to make Israel so strong like an immovable rock that they're only going to end up hurting themselves. That grin, he really doesn't know when to shut it off, does he? I should take this time with his grin there to point out that 40% of the people who have been killed in Gaza have been children. That's the hurting themselves he is talking about. That they're only going to end up hurting themselves. The plan of God. And God says in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless Israel, and I will curse those who curse Israel. His eye is on this land because he chose this particular location and among these particular people through which to reveal his ultimate redemptive plan for the sake of the whole world. So if you've ever wondered why all the hatred for the Jews, why all the fuss over a little country smaller than the state of New Jersey, that's where it comes from. Anti-Semitism is Satanism. I mean, I think a lot of that anti-Semitism comes from Christians first being mad that they think they killed their God and then scapegoating them for the black plague and saying they were possessed by demons and then saying that they drank the blood of Christian babies. It's not spiritual. It's just hate. It's bigotry. It's that classic Christian love. This is a spiritual war that we're seeing happening here. Well, sure, it's being fought in physical ways. But this is a spiritual war inciting all of this. So that's the real answer. Now, and, and I think we have a different version of the word real here. The real answer isn't Satanism and demons or whatever. The real answer to why people don't like the nation of Israel is a different question than why people are anti-Semitic. 
It might have something to do with armed forces making people leave their homes, decades of violence, not being able to vote, not being able to move around without papers, while other Israeli citizens could freely exist and take part in elections. It could have something to do with the continued violence from the IDF and a systematic dehumanization of the Palestinian people. Or maybe it's spiritual and maybe it's Satanism. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Christians should definitely support the nation of Israel. We must remember that Israel, the nation, is very special to God. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 6 through 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. This is speaking of Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for Himself. Now, if this triggers you, I'm sorry, but that's the Bible. And this is not speaking of Slavics, Hispanics, or people in Africa, or Asians. This is speaking of the Jewish people. God is saying He has chosen them to be a special treasure. And this again, this may trigger some of us, above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Yeah, it was their religion that made them up. So that makes sense. Americans think they are the greatest country in the world. Australians think they live in the best country in the world. And as Canadians, we think that our country is pretty neat. And uh, we're sorry if that offends you. And your country is really nice too. But if you're making a religion that is also tied to your country's identity, you might include that your God thinks that you are the best country. Let's start with who the Jews are to begin with. They are God's chosen people that he handpicked for himself to bring glory to his name through. God said, I didn't choose you because you were many in number. In fact, you're fewer than other nations. I chose you because I love you. And the Jewish people were placed in a homeland given to them by God. It's called Israel today. By the way, they're only inhabiting a small portion of the actual land that God gave to them. 300,000 square miles is roughly what God originally intended for the Jewish people to have, from the Nile River in Egypt to the Euphrates River that, that runs through Iraq and Syria. Israel never occupied this much land, even though God had deeded this to them, Genesis 15, 18. The Jewish people never occupied this amount of land. Maybe don't brag about failed Bible prophecy in your sermon about why this is fulfilled Bible prophecy. God said that they would have this much land and they never did. So doesn't that make God wrong? Or, or what, they were just humble and cool with having less and they said, nah, it's cool, God. Because it, to me, just seems like the Bible uh, was wrong. Joel 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem... Notice, God says, I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what that means, by the way? God's a Zionist. Did you just hear what I just said? Do you, need, do you even know? Listen, I know many of you have been to college, so you don't know. <laughs> God is a Zionist, which means he says in the Bible, I wrote my name on Mount Zion. To be a Zionist means the land belongs to Israel. To be a Zionist means God fulfills his promises. Do you see why your family's in a big debate over this issue? Are you stupid? Come on, man, you sound like a Zionist. I am a Zionist because I've read my Bible. Don't apologize for that. That's what woke does. The word woke can just mean whatever, can't it? Like they can just make it mean whatever they want it to mean. I think that we shouldn't displace people from their home and make them suffer and then make their children suffer and then their children's children suffer. Oh, so you've gone woke, have you? Woke says, are you a Zionist? You say, I am. I've read, I, I don't know where that accent just came from. <laughs> I am, I'm a Zionist. I read my Bible because God is, God says, I'm going to rebuild my nation again. 
Ah, they're just having fun, aren't they? Just a grand old time, laughing it up, siding with the oppressors. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste of desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. And then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. In other words, here's what he's telling us, that in the 2,500 years from the time that Israel was dispersed in 586 B.C. and the temple was destroyed uh, and, and following, 2,500 years, the land of Israel became desolate and barren. Now, some of Israel is desert by itself, but even what was otherwise lush fields and vineyards and the mountains would not yield fruit or vegetation. It would just become an arid wasteland because it was uninhabited and and the land itself was dominated by foreign empires that didn't invest in it. And so when the Jews are dispersed over 2,500 years, the land just becomes just desolate and barren. In 1867, Mark Twain made a visit to Israel, and he would later write a description about what he saw. Listen to what he wrote, quote, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country." End quote. Mark Twain, 1867, that he later would write in his writings entitled The Innocence Abroad, published in 1881. And yet, God took this otherwise desolate wasteland and made it fruitful again. When God brought the Jewish people back to this land in 1948 and since, Israel has become one of the most prosperous and prolific nations on the planet. You guys, Mark Twain passed through Israel and he said, this is the most worthless, treeless, godless landscape I've ever seen. Mark Twain. You go to Israel today, I could sneak you, I could sneak a picture in Israel today, and take a picture and show you, and you'd say, and I'd ask you, where, where, where is this picture taken? And you'd say, mm, kind of maybe somewhere near Zephyr Cove up in Lake Tahoe, or maybe Chino Hills, with the rolling hills and the oaks. No. What about those vineyards? Oh, that's Napa, or France. No, that's the upper Galilee region. It's a paradise today. Are you hearing me? Yes. It's a fact. Yes. I, I, I'm so-, so instead of looking at the actual history of the area, they're just going to quote from Mark Twain's book, The Innocents Abroad, that is considered to be a racist book with an arrogant and cynical view of anywhere in the world that isn't America, a book that includes an essay called Pleasure Excursion to the Holy Land, the part they quoted. That is a favorite essay for many, many Zionists. So much so that when Netanyahu met with Obama for the first time in 2009, he brought with him a copy of this essay. The fact is that Palestine was a hub for trade and a very busy place. It exported grain, soap, cotton, and and guess what? Loads of fruits and vegetables throughout Europe. So maybe it's less that God blessed Israel for taking over and more that they just took over a land that was already producing lots of fruit. But when it comes to Israel, these pastors are obsessed with May 14th, 1948. Friend, this is a very, very important date in all of human history as it relates to Bible prophecy, because before this date, many of the Bible scholars were asking the question, how is he going to be able to fulfill these promises to restore Israel as a nation back to their land if they are not a nation at all. And so the fact that on May 14th, 1948, this sets this in motion that now Israel is a fortified nation. Now it's setting the stage 
for God to fulfill the promises that he's going to physically restore. But it wasn't like there was no rapture predictions before 1948. Rapture predictions were huge in the 1800s. You might say it was a booming business. The evangelist William Miller had a huge following, and he said that Christ would return by October of 1844. And this movement was so huge that it went on to inspire the creation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, and Times enthusiasts are happy about Israel becoming a nation because there's more stuff they can use, but it wasn't necessary. They could have still made predictions without it. The prophetic clock stopped and did not start again until May 14, 1948, when the nation Israel was reborn in a day, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 66, saying, a nation shall be born in one day. That nation was Israel. It was the greatest miracle since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can write down, right next to Isaiah 66, verse 8, you can write down May 14th, 1948. There's no other nation, listen, skeptic, no other nation in the history of mankind that has had its rebirth in one day except Israel. Every nation was built in a day if you only count the day that it was declared a nation. The Zionist movement had been growing for 50 years before 1948. The Balfour Declaration was issued 30 years prior, with Britain pledging to support a Jewish nation in Palestine. A Zionist presence in Palestine had been committing acts of terrorism for a number of years by 1948. This didn't just happen overnight. They didn't wake up in the morning of May 14th and say, hey, let's make a new nation today. But ever since then, they have been obsessed with this date as a sign that Jesus is coming back. Pretty much all saying that the generation alive when it happened will not pass away before Christ's return the terminal generation, as they call it. For thousands of years, the prophecies contained in the Bible remained cryptic, even mysterious, symbols of heads, horns, and beasts. Great Bible expositors like John Calvin and Martin Luther declined to write commentaries on Daniel or the book of Revelation. They were widely regarded as simply symbolic rather than literal. In this generation, the books of Daniel and the Apocalypse read like today's headlines. Jack, was this the beginning of the end of the age, do you think, Jack? It really was. And I'm proud of America because Harry Truman was the first to congratulate the new nation called Israel. This was the beginning of the end. Yes. Why? Listen to Jesus, Matthew 24, verses 32 through 34. He said, Learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, all the signs of Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapters 17 and 21, all these things happening simultaneously with the fig tree coming to life, Israel becoming a nation, then know that my coming is near. How near? Even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation. And some have figured that to mean that the Jewish race would never be obliterated because Genea can mean race, but that's not what he's saying here. The, this generation, the one that lives to see the fig tree coming to life, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, but now it's been nearly 76 years and the number of people still alive are becoming fewer and fewer so they have to find other dates to use, and they have to switch around this generation thing. People talk about the occupiers. You shouldn't, you shouldn't talk like that anymore, because you don't know what you're talking about. Amen. To say that Israel is the occupying force is to say that the Bible's not true. It's to say that God doesn't know what he's doing. It's to say that you do not believe in history. But the Jews are not occupiers. If you know your history at all, the Jews are the indigenous people of the land. They are the indigenous people of the land. They were living in this land 2,100 years before anyone was ever called or referred to as Palestinian. 
They were there 2,100 years before anyone was ever referred to as a Palestinian. And they were living in that land 2,600 years before Islam was ever a religion. Yes, it is horrifying what has happened to the Jewish people throughout the centuries. The Crusades, the centuries of persecution and anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, which was the worst thing that humanity has ever done, and the continued anti-Semitism today. I am not dismissing that. This wasn't the fault of the people who were living in this land when the British and the Zionist forces decided that their homes were no longer their homes. It wasn't the fault of those families who have been displaced for 76 years. It's not the fault of the families that are suffering today. You don't get to come back centuries later and do this, no matter the reasons. It's just not right. The Jews never attempted, even though we went through hardships, the Inquisition, uh, the Crusades, and we suffered a lot, but we never attempted to to reestablish a Jewish sovereignty, a Jewish nationhood, a Jewish kingdom, because we know it's verboten, it's forbidden, it's just not acceptable according to Judaism to have our own state. Remember, the religion is 3,000 years ago. But 2,000 years ago, we were sent into exile by God. We have to be loyal citizens in every country we reside. And we're not to attempt to leave exile because it's a godly declared exile. Jews lived with a distinctly bored from the world, evangelistic Christians, Jews who don't know the Torah, don't know their laws, uh, who don't practice the laws. So they knew they'll go to Palestine and they'll be able to tell everybody, oh, this is the God-given land to the Jewish people. They automatically started breaching and transgressing the laws of the Torah not to kill and not to steal, not to oppress the people because they, they're, they're, they wanted to make their national home in a land that was inhabited by the Palestinian people. Because it is God's land, I think you will agree, if the Lord says the land is mine and you believe God, so you believe that, then God has the right to do whatever he wants with the land that is his. Fine, that's fine, yeah. I get that. Just don't ever claim that he's a good God then. You don't get to make that claim anymore then. Right? So that's fact number one. Fact number two, God gave the land to Abraham and his descendants. In chapter 12, when the Lord called Abram out of Mesopotamia and said, go to that place, that land of Canaan, I'm going to bless you there and multiply you. You'll be a blessing to the world. Why is Hamas so intent on destroying the Jewish people and wiping Israel off the map? You really could trace it all the way back to animosity in the book of Genesis. Abraham had a son of the covenant, his name was Isaac. But Abraham, in a moment of flesh, slept with Hagar, a slave woman from Egypt. It was not part of the will of God, the plan of God, and a son was born, his name was Ishmael. The descendants of Ishmael are the Arab people. The descendants of Isaac, the promise that was revealed through the child Isaac, Abraham's son, are the Jewish people. Is this, tell me if you can see the problem, you've got one covenant and two sons. You got one covenant and two wives. Both wives are going to be advocating that their son be the promised son who gets the covenant promise. There's no reason to believe that Abraham, Isaac, or Ishmael ever existed. But even if they did, there is no reason at all to believe that Arab people are descended from Ishmael. This is just a tradition passed down with zero basis. Even if they were descended from Ishmael, that's not a reason to subjugate them. That's not a reason to persecute them. That's not a reason to kick them out of their homes. This isn't a spiritual battle. This is a real life thing that is happening before our eyes. In AD 135, the Roman Emperor Hadrian, in order to quash a Jewish revolt, dispersed the Jews from Jerusalem. And then he renamed the entire region in Latin, Palestina. Palestina, he named it because that's the Latin term for the Philistines. And why did Hadrian do that? Because the Philistines were the perennial enemies of the Jews. So Hadrian, as a way to dishonor the Jewish people after this revolt that they tried to uh, come against the Roman Empire, Hadrian quashed the revolt and said, but now I'm going to take away Israel from the name of your land and I'm going to name it Palestina. 
Did you know it was the Roman Empire that came up with the word Palestine really as an insult to the Jewish people because they were effectively naming their land Judea. That's what it's called in the Bible. But instead calling it Palestine, it's rooted in the word Philistine when the Romans were ruling over the Jewish people. So the idea today that 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 piece of territory always belonged to the Palestinian state. Actually, Romans called that territory Palestine, Palestine to insult Israel because their longest enemy was Philistines and they were insulting them by calling that area Palestine. But Roman Empire is gone. It comes from the Romans, Palestina. The Romans destroyed the ancient nation of Israel or Judea, slaughtered countless numbers of Jewish people, took others captive into exile. And in order to erase the name and memory of Israel, they renamed the land and they renamed it after Israel's ancient enemies who were called the Pilashtim or the Philistines. Okay, so why tell this story at all? Why do they feel the need to say this? First of all, there is no reason to believe this story. Yes, it has the same root word as Philistine, but it wasn't meant as like a cruel joke or a way to mock Jewish people. The name Palestine, or a version of that name, had existed for centuries before the Roman occupation. Yes, it was associated with the Philistines linguistically because they lived there, or at least they were said to have lived there. And Hadrian may have had a significant role in the popularization of that term, but it's less to do about mocking people and more to do about his love for Greek antiquity. But either way, even if it was used to make fun of them, how does that change it from being a human rights issue? Why should the modern day people suffer because somebody was mean 2,000 years ago? So why, why bring this story up? Is it maybe because it's a famous Zionist talking point and it's meant to devalue human life? Or maybe all of these pastors just thought it was a fun story. This intentionally sets up rocket launchers at schools, and hospitals and civilian apartment buildings, knowing that when Israel retaliates, it'll be wonderful optics for Hamas when it shows innocent civilians killed in hospitals and schools looking like Israel was targeting those things. No, Israel is targeting the rocket launchers that Hamas intentionally sets up there because they are using Palestinian civilians as human shields. Okay, so first of all, the IDF is famous for using human shields. Horrifying moments that would scar 11-year-old Majid's life forever. On January 15, 2009, as Israel's war was in full swing, Israeli soldiers took over the neighborhood of Tel El Hawa. They entered Majid's building where they found his family and dozens of others taking refuge in the cold and dark basement of their building. Majid was pulled away from his mother. No idea what will lie ahead as Israeli soldiers took them away. First they pushed us, shoved us and insulted us. Then they divided us in small groups and used us as human shields. The Israelis were afraid of going into the houses, so they would send us ahead to tell people to evacuate. They made me dig holes in the wall and enter the houses first to check in case they were booby-trapped. We were put in front, so in case of gunfire, we would be the ones on the... ...shop he owns in the occupied West Bank town of Dura. Baha Abu Ras is playing video footage on his phone from Monday. He says it shows the moment an Israeli soldier used him as a human shield marching him up a street while resting a rifle on his shoulder and guiding him toward the center of town. Two Israeli soldiers advance carefully behind. Second, the point of a human shield is to stop the attack, because most people know that you're less likely to blow up a hospital full of people, including children and babies on life support. But if you're an evil government, you wouldn't care. So even if there were Hamas under the hospitals, you're still bad for blowing it up. Find a more diplomatic way to do it. And there's no actual evidence that any of these hospitals or schools or churches or ambulances that the IDF has blown up are actually Hamas threats at all. Israel is simply showing that they care way more about blowing everything up and showing their strength than they do about human life. 
They've even prevented their own Palestinian people from exiting Gaza City. Have you been hearing this? Listen, by the way, what nation drops leaflets in the language of that nation and tells them in advance, you better get out, we're coming in for the bad guys? But that's what Israel's been doing. They've been dropping, dropping leaflets from the sky in Arabic. Get out of Gaza, get out of Gaza. Israel's been saying this over and over and over again. What you tell me, what nation or what country is about to respond to a terrorist attack and says, by the way, if you're innocent, get out. We're going to give you time to leave. So a nation that wants to make excuses and say that anyone who didn't move is now an enemy and is now a fair target. Do you remember what happened when we were all watching the Super Bowl? When Israel bombed Rafa? After those leaflets told everyone that it was safe to go there? The organization is actually an acronym that translates from Arabic, the Islamic Resistance Movement. So it is, it is an acronym that the group has used. However, the word Hamas itself, it's kind of a dual play on words, because Hamas in Arabic means zeal or strength. It's interesting, in Hebrew, the word Hamas is also a Hebrew word spelled C-H-A-M-A-S, and Hamas in Hebrew means violence. Violence. Four. Now, we know Hamas is in the Bible. Like, this is my, where the video might get taken down, because somebody did a video on this, and their video got taken down. Hamas is in the Bible. In fact, the word Hamas is a Hebrew word that appears 68 times in Scripture. Hamas is the Hebrew word for violence. And this is what a word study guide says about the Hebrew word. They say it's a masculine noun meaning violence or wrong. It implies, this is the Hebrew word, cruelty, damage, and injustice. Is that not what's happening right now? And I want to introduce you to something, if you're not familiar with it, uh, that I will call the Hamas spirit. And what we know is that Hamas is both a Palestinian terror organization and a word in the Hebrew scriptures. First, the Hamas spirit first appears in the days of Noah. We're going back 4,000 years into history. And here's what Genesis 6, 11 says. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. If you think of this in comparison, it tells us in Judges 21, 25, that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And here what it says is that you need to do what's right in God's eyes. And so what was happening here was the same thing that we're seeing in Judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. No one was doing what was right in God's eyes. Uh, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight or God's eyes, and the earth was filled, also an ancient word that can mean possessed like demon possessed, with violence, the original Hebrew word Hamas. Hamas. So Hamas is a demonic spirit. Hamas in Arabic means zeal. It's a Palestinian acronym for the Islamic resistance movement. Here in the Hebrew, it means violence. Various English translations of this Hebrew word, Hamas, will use the word violence, iniquity, wickedness, cruelty, lawlessness, and rotten to the core. It's evil. That we care about his people, Hamas, who is fueled by satanic power, fully embodied by demons, doesn't care about you. If you are a Palestinian and you think Hamas has your best interest in mind, they absolutely don't. They're the ones starting this war and we need to pray that this war ends swiftly and that Hamas is completely, as Israel said, eliminated because they are fully satanic. Am I a fan of Hamas? Nope, not even a little bit. But do I think that saying it's a demonic force instead of actually looking at why they are angry, is in any way helpful to anyone? You can't even take the time to try to empathize why people in Palestine, why people in the Gaza Strip, why people in the West Bank may be a little bit angry. You can't even take the time to do that. You just want it to be a Hamas spirit. You just want it to be a demon. There's this Black Mirror episode where soldiers are fighting what they think are these like monster alien creatures and then it turns out that they had a chip or something inside their head that simply disguises these people that they were supposed to kill and make them look evil and make them look different to make it easier to kill them. And we haven't done that with the chip yet, but we've always been really good at dehumanizing people that we want to kill, whether through propaganda, through racism, or through literally demonizing them.
when you dismiss it as a spiritual war because Ishmael or Goliath or, or whatever else, instead of looking at the actual reality of what is happening to actual human beings, it's easier to feel better about killing. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. Read it carefully. The Hebrew word kill is not there. It's murder. God sanctions war because God knows until the Prince of Peace returns, there's going to be wars. Does that make some sense? When you talk about, well, you know, wait a minute. Israel needs to kind of tone it down and be proportional. Who says such things? Those who are on the other side. Notice that when the bad guys are advancing, it's full-blown. We're going to drive into the sea. We're going to kill you. We're going to destroy you. And then when you start losing, you yell for a ceasefire. I think that's called hudna. Ceasefire, ceasefire. It means this. Ceasefire, ceasefire. Reload, reload. Ceasefire, ceasefire. Quick, hurry, reload, reload. How do all these people grin when they say this stuff? How does he grin like he's excited that he found a loophole for killing entire families because it's wartime? I mean, I know it's what God loved to do in the Bible, but do these people have any humanity left in them at all? These aren't battlefields. These are neighborhoods. Hoda, good morning. This is a fast-moving and developing situation, but here's what we know. Early this morning, a crowd of Palestinians gathered on a coastal road in Gaza City. They were hoping to get food and flour from an aid distribution point. The Palestinian Authority says Israeli forces opened fire on that crowd of unarmed civilians. They are calling this a massacre. You begin to see all the suffering of the Palestinian people. Israel gets blamed a lot for that. Israel has been supplying up until this war, electricity, humanitarian aid, food, allowing people from Gaza to come over for work. That is because Gaza, the Gaza Strip, is under Israeli control. It's not a separate nation. It is now considered to be part of Israel, which means the Israeli government is their government. This is why most people say that the Gaza Strip is an open-air prison within Israel. Providing electricity and basic necessities isn't a kindness. It's following international law. Cutting it off is where they are breaking the law. That's where they become monsters. They were monsters before, but that's where they become even more so. Allowing people who live in their country, who were born there, to come over for work and only for work, usually in an exploitative labor practice, is also not a kindness. But they reached out this week. Israel is in the midst of a war, started back on October 7th. You're going to hear more about that in a minute. But more than 70,000 Israelis have been displaced from their homes in Gaza and in the north, anticipating perhaps another war in the north. And hundreds of thousands of other Israelis are out of work because the tourism industry is gone. And, but for those families, their lives since October have been completely upended. The kids aren't going to their normal schools, all of their normal activities. Think of your own children. No proms, no ball games. None of the activities with their friends, most of them are being, um, they've been moved into hotels or kibbutz, places in very cramped quarters. The businessman that called said, we've put together a plan where we can give those families a break. We've got tour buses that aren't being used and we're going to fill tour buses and take them to the national parks and we'll feed them for the day and give the families an outing to give them a break from the monotony of their lives. Do you think your congregation would be interested in making a contribution? When your side is worried about the tourist industry and maybe missing prom, and the other side has over 30,000 dead, including about 12,000 children, maybe you aren't on the morally superior side. This was Imad, smiling, happy, alive. The last good memories his parents have of their son, who was three and a half years old. He was in the arms of his 20-year-old cousin, Hadil, a medical student at university, when they were gunned down. Their last moments are captured in this video. I, personally, I say fuck their tourist industry. 
It is wrong on the campuses. It is wrong. I'm going to stand in the pulpit as long as I got the microphone. And I'm going to say you're as wrong as you can be. If you curse that nation, God will curse you. God will curse your family. God will curse this nation. And if we bless that nation, God will bless you, will bless your family, and he will bless your nation. I say God bless America and God bless Israel. Does that mean we don't love Palestinians? Absolutely not. Does that mean God doesn't love Palestinians? Absolutely not. Should we weep? Should we cry? Should we pray for the Palestinians? 100% just like we do everybody else. But what do we do when the whole world is trying to wipe out that nation and that race? You see, the reason the devil hates them so much is because he knows Jesus is coming back and he can't come back if the Jews are not in the land called Israel and in a city called Jerusalem. So everything he's doing is trying to get the whole world to wipe them out so Jesus can't come. But he who... Boy, I feel like preaching. But he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And I promise you, nobody's going to move them out of that land. I don't care who they are. I don't care how powerful, how rich. There is so much that this all-powerful God that they love so much simply cannot do. And if these atrocities are necessary for him to come back, then maybe he can just stay away. If his people are any indication of his leadership style, I think we'd be better off without him. Me out to eat lunch. And we were driving down the street and we saw all this commotion up here on the side of the road and we drove up there and it was about a hundred people, but more people were walking in from every direction and they were waving pro-Palestinian flags and shouting that Israel was committing genocide in Gaza uh, and that Israel was an apartheid state. And so all these kinds of things. Because of the thousands of people they've been killing and the laws that are specifically apartheid laws. It was shocking to me that it was happening in my neighborhood. The other thing that was shocking to me is how many cars were passing by honking in support of them. And this is what's happening. It's very popular uh, to be pro-Palestinian right now. Uh, President Biden was giving a speech yesterday and he was interrupted over a dozen times by these pro-Palestinian demonstrators that were demanding that they stop the uh, that they call for a ceasefire in Gaza. And so this this nuttiness that's going on, this anti-Semitism that's going on right now, it's one of the major end time signs because Zechariah 12, Joel chapter three, both say that at the very end, all the world will march against Jerusalem. All the world will march against Israel. That's Armageddon. We're protesting atrocities committed by human beings. It's not about anti-Semitism. It's not about the end times. It's not about stopping the apocalypse. It's about human beings suffering needlessly at the hands of other human beings. This generation of young adults is very concerned about humanitarian causes. You're concerned about, quote, the underdog or the disadvantaged or people without a voice. And you're to be commended for that. Don't ever stop caring for people who are disadvantaged. Um, You, because of your compassion for people, that's why you are quick to jump on certain causes. And you're passionate about these things. And so, you know, you want to end sex trafficking and and you want to, you know, end world hunger and and you're concerned about the environment and all these and all these different causes and all these different issues. And again, I just want to say, because you care about people, especially those who are disadvantaged, don't ever stop caring for people. Your compassion is needed. But now here's the challenge. But here's the challenge for you today. Stop caring about these people because it messes up my Bible prophecy. Know why you are part of that cause and get your facts straight. Because sometimes you are quick to jump on the bandwagon of the latest cause, the latest issue, the latest group that appears to be disadvantaged, and you don't even know why you're a part of that cause, and you can't even intellectually defend it. And you end up looking silly. You look silly. Most young people, in fact, a lot of adults don't even know the history of the land of Israel I just shared with you. 
And so young adults are believing this false narrative. The Jews are the occupiers. The Jews are the colonialists. This is our land. You know, look, you can have compassion for the Palestinian people. Fine, you should. But don't forget what happened October the 7th, 2023, and stop trying to accuse the Israelis of being the ones who are the bullies. There are 22 Arab states, 52 Muslim states, one Jewish state. Who's the bully? You tell me. Who's the bully? What does that have to do with anything? People are taken from their homes. People are being oppressed. Where they can be and when in their own home country, solely based on their ethnicity. And now they're condemning Israel, and they're saying this is genocide. Genocide is when you wipe out a group of people. There are two million residents of Gaza. Right now, the last death toll I heard of the Israelis killing Hamas, and there's been some citizens that died, was 24,000. Okay, well, that's a little over 1%. That's, that's, uh, if, uh, genocide is 100%. You go in and you just kill people. The Israelis have done everything they can to preserve life. It's Hamas that has built their military installations under nurseries, preschools, elementary schools, hospitals, and in residential neighborhood. They use their people as a shield. The Israelis don't do that. The Israelis protect their citizens and the Palestinian citizens. They don't go in and just carelessly kill uh, civilians. When you are counting the deaths and counting the percentage of the population that those deaths are as a way to say that your side isn't doing a genocide, it's probably fair to say at the least you're on the wrong side. And just because a genocide isn't over doesn't mean it's not a genocide. That uh, the majority of those who have been killed are women and children uh, since the 7th of October, and also more than 70,000 people have been injured as well. These figures rely on bodies being brought in uh, to hospitals or seen uh, by medical workers so they can be uh, properly registered. Um, but actually, it's thought that real death toll is going to be much higher than this because there are several thousand people who are still considered as being missing in Gaza, many of them buried under the rubble of buildings that have been hit by Israeli airstrikes. Now it's another topic. Why do Christians support Israel? Here is an exaggerated view. I've heard it said the reason Christians support Israel today is because they want Armageddon to break out and they want Jesus Christ to come back again. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, we do believe that God has brought the Jewish people back to their homeland in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And on May 14th, 1948, when Israel officially became a nation, that was a super sign of the end times and the prophetic clock began to tick. Having said that, yes, God brought them back to the land, but the last thing we want as Christians is to see war break out there. In fact, we're told in scripture to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But everybody here so far has said the opposite. Everybody is seeing this as a sign of the end times. And everybody has been saying that God has to have it this way in order for Christ to return. We have to support what's happening because we want Christ to return. People in Christian circles, they believe that all of this that I just described, Jesus coming back, the great tribulation happening, us being raptured to meet the Lord, and then God defending Israel through Jesus Christ, establishing His kingdom, all of that is symbolic, none of that is literal. But we as Christians believe in literal rapture, literal second coming of Jesus. Literal one, mil, mil, one million, one, one thousand, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on this earth. The Antichrist who is the spirit who is present yet there will be one bad boy that's going to come out who's going to create a last challenge to the world, to the church and to the Israel and that literal defeat of Antichrist. What do we do in spite of all this? I'm going to give you just six things that we do. Number one is we wait for the second coming. Not of Jesus, not for the second coming of Trump. So friend, listen to this. If God does not keep his promises to Israel in their eternal covenant, Abrahamic covenant. If God doesn't keep that covenant, you're not going to go to heaven. I'm not going to go to heaven. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the Pope right now or you're a brand new Christian giving your heart to Christ. You're not going to heaven. Because if God can't keep his promises to Israel, he has no obligation to keep his promises to you. 
Of course, I'm being rather sarcastic right now because the fact is God will keep his promises to Israel. That's why the Christian should defend and protect and to watch out for Israel. Because God who promises Israel, he's going to keep those promises. He's the same God that made promises to you that he would save you and that the cross is effectual, that what Jesus did do as a Jew died on the cross in Jerusalem in the occupied land that the Romans occupied called Israel. Nowhere in the Bible, by the way, is Israel ever called Palestine. Okay, that's just not in the Bible. It's never been. It's never going to be. It's always been the land of Israel. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to heaven, but not for the reason that he thinks. But even if heaven exists and me speaking up for an oppressed people, for a persecuted people, for a people that are being murdered on the street for trying to eat, whose houses are being blown up, whose hospitals are being blown up. If me saying that I don't think that should happen means that I can't go to heaven, okay, no problem. I don't want to hang out with that guy anyway. I was really nervous about making this video because certain people are really convinced that everything Israel is doing is great and questioning them in any way means that I am a hateful person. But I can't be silent. I can't be silent anymore about what is happening. I can't stand by as the religion that I used to confess with my mouth, that I dedicated my life to for 30 years, that I was convinced was the path to salvation, that I was telling other people was the path to salvation, a religion that I helped convert people to. I can't stand by while they enthusiastically support such a horrific thing. For me, this channel has never been about pointing fingers at Christians and saying, ha ha, you suck. It's about seeing myself in that service on a Sunday morning, listening to this kind of rhetoric and wishing I could go back and shake that naive man and snap him out of it and say, this is wrong and you need to do better. I'm not pointing at some other, I'm pointing at myself and people I see as a reflection of myself. And I won't stand by anymore. Let's all use our voices. Let's do what we can to make change. Pressure your governments. Protest when you can. Stand up for what's right. Speak out. Speak out on social media. We need to show our solidarity. We need to stand up for these people. Thank you for making it this far. I know this wasn't an easy one. Um, if you know somebody who may want to watch this and may not hate you forever after you send it to them, send it their way, and you're all just the best. And Thank you for everything. Right, buddy? Yeah, you're a good boy. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs>